Hello and welcome to the Art Class Curator podcast. I am Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator and the Curated Connections Library. We're here to talk about teaching art with purpose and inspiration, from the daily delights of creativity to the messy mishaps that come with being a teacher. Whether you're driving home from school or cleaning up your classroom for the 15th time today, take a second, take a deep breath, relax those shoulders, and let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Art Class Curator Podcast. This is Cindy Ingram, and last week I had a really exciting conversation. Well, it was super exciting for me. I can't wait to hear how y'all thought about it, but a conversation with Madeline Gregory, who uh, works with Art Class Curator and is also one of my best friends. And the artwork that we discussed last week was Life and Death by Gustav Klimt. I left that conversation so excited. It was like the best hour ever, (laughs) like probably my whole week or my whole month. Like I just enjoyed it so very much. And then even after it was over, our conversation was over, we kept talking about the art. We talked about it for a bit in Zoom after the conversation, and then we kept talking about it on Voxer. And we realized that we missed a lot of really important things And we decided to do a follow-up conversation. So I am here with Madeline again, just a few days later from our original conversation. The first one hasn't even aired, but we realized it was so important to add in more insight. So welcome back, Madeline. Hello. And one of the things I want to point out is just how excited I was about the conversation is the same feeling that I get when I lead an art discussion with students. You know, when when everything clicks, when everything goes really well, you feel, I, I always felt so energized, so excited, excited at the possibility of art, excited at my students and their perspectives, excited about just connecting with art, excited about teaching. Like it's all just so exciting. And I think because I have that emotion around it, that's what I want everyone else to have. So I hope that you are inspired by that and are seeking out that experience for yourself in your own classroom, and even just with your own friends having conversations about art. That's something you could try too, because we've never really fully done that to the extent that we did. And it was pretty amazing. How did you feel after our conversation, Madeline? Oh, I felt just energized and like giddy because it just talking about big things and, you know, being able to look at something that's so inspiring and thought-provoking. It just, it's a good way to spend your time and your life, I think. And, um, you know, what you were saying about how it feels to do that with students too, you know, I've never been in the classroom, but I've homeschooled my children for many years. And we've been in homeschool co-ops where I've taught art class curator lessons. And, you know, it's usually just a very few students and teenagers or maybe a little uh, preteens, but every single time, even if it was an artwork that I had discussed with other kids several times, every conversation, every discussion was new and fresh. And even the kids that maybe were quiet during the discussion and the activities, they would bring in something brand new that I had never heard before or even thought about before and totally shifts the way I see the artwork. And it's just, it's wonderful every time. So I'm excited that we get to do this again. Yeah, that is so true. You could, I could be teaching the same artwork, having conversations with students like 20 times of the same artwork. And there's always something new that no one has ever noticed or no one has ever pointed out. And that just, it's like, it's like, I read this book by Gretchen Rubin one time. Actually, don't rep- recommend that book. But she said one thing. She moved, and it was like she moved a few blocks away, and she said that her whole world picked itself up, restructured itself, and put it back down at, at her new house. Like she had, she lived in New York City, and she had to like, you know, it just reoriented you. And I feel like that's kind of the same thing that what happens with the art when someone brings up something you've never seen before. It's just like the art picks itself up, shifts itself around, puts itself back, and now you never see it the same way again. And I think that's it's really fun. And I love when I see something that I never even noticed before. I I get so focused on looking at one part that there's something in there that I haven't even seen, even though I spent an hour looking at it with the group of kids. So it's super fun when that happens. I love that. Okay, so 
I think our conversation was so good and, and we talked about a lot of things, but we realized after the fact that there was a huge gender issue in the way we discussed it. So I thought we could start with with that. And since you're the one that made that observation, can you tell us what you realized after we were done? Uh, so it was kind of two-pronged, I think. And one thing that we did whenever we were talking about it is we kept referring to the death figure as a man. And we didn't even like question it or like bump on it and all. And I thought that that was really interesting because I mean, I don't know a lot about skulls, but I feel like in the (laughs) presence of this artwork, like I don't think it's necessarily meant to be a man and why I really wanted to dig into why we automatically went there. Yeah. That's huge. And we, you know, we, we have been lately talking about gender a lot because it's just, especially with TikTok, we're hearing a lot more things about gender and just our world is becoming more understanding of what gender is and isn't. And it was, it's so fascinating to see that those sort of that gender um, conditioning that we have like play out in real life. So yeah, that skeleton, skeletons don't have genders. Do is it true we have one more rib that women that women might have one more rib or is that <laughs> I don't think that's true. I do think in general you know, female bodies or uh, have or are smaller in general like that kind of holds oh. true. Um and I think maybe like the shape of like the pelvis and stuff but I don't think like as far as the skull goes I don't think there's a whole lot of difference there yeah that's the only part that we see yeah we don't see any body that it's draped in fabric there's no indication of the shape of the body underneath it you know it's funny because I'm like well what is there to discuss here other than we had the awareness that it was a really big awareness yeah it's like well I really wanted to probe myself as Mm -hmm. for why I automatically went okay this is a male figure and I think it's because it's death I think you know we think of when you think of death you think of you know sad things that can happen and accidents and sickness and all that but the other big one is war and war Mm. is directly associated with masculinity and you know only men were drafted and you know there are these stories of women in battles and in wars throughout history but of course it's mostly been male dominated and continues to be so and we don't really think of women in war or death scenarios and I think that that is you know kind of harmful to everyone because we talked a lot too about the women in the artwork and how, you know, they were kind of porcelain skinned and they looked dainty and fragile. And you brought up how it looked like the man in the center was kind of carrying them and not feeling his own emotions. And I think that that's really reflected in the way that gender stereotypes play out because, you know, women or culturally have been having this moment and continue to have this moment with the Me Too movement and, you know, calling out the patriarchy. But, you know, we as women have like this language now that we can start using and, you know, relying on feminism. And we haven't really done that for the men because the gender stereotypes are just as harmful to them as they are to us. And, you know, pushing down that emotion and being expected to be at the beck and call of war. I mean, that's, that's a lot to carry and they don't have the language or the tools that I think women do now. Yeah. Oh, that's really fascinating. I have a, a couple thoughts that while you were talking is one, in addition to what you were saying about the war, I think, Two, that we're conditioned to see men as the authority figures. So if there's an authority figure in the painting, we're going to, it just, it's natural for them to be a man. Yeah. Um, And until we see more women 
in positions of power, that's just where we're going to go to. Like they've done those research studies of children and they about like, they talk about doctors, but they don't say the gender. And, and then they pull the children to see like whose doctor was a male and whose doctor was female. Like, I, I think that has changed though. I think they've, it's slowly getting better. The data yeah. on that. Well, it's like the joke that, I mean, they were definitely still telling whenever I was a kid of, you know, the kids in the hospital, but the parent can't operate and, you know, but it ends up that the mom was the doctor the whole time. And it relies on the fact that you think that a doctor is male. Yeah. And then I, I love what you were saying too about men. And I mean, obviously neither of us are men, but we see it in the men in our lives that they have this sort of expectation. Like my husband, for example, I hope he's okay with me <laughs> using him as an example. I'll ask him later, make sure. But, you know, he's not like, you know, uh, going hunting and fishing type of guy. He doesn't like want to like sling around tools. He prefers to like build computers rather than, you know, do household things. But I've he's talked about it before that it does, he does feel that expectation of him in the world. But he's actually really good at just saying, no, I'm not going to, that's not who I am. That's not what I'm going to do. But I think a lot of men don't feel that they have the confidence to, or they don't, they don't feel it's okay to, I don't know, release that. Yeah. I think it is changing. I mean, I see a lot now about, you know, even when I was growing up, it was still very much boys don't cry and, yeah, you know, and boys will be boys and all of that. And it's, it's subtly shifting over time. People are, recognizing that and trying to break that pattern yeah but I think the fact that you know we did just immediately go to the authority figure here being male is really indicative of just how deeply ingrained it is and how hard it is to you know tear that down in yourself much less in a whole society yeah because I feel at some level, I think that the women have to have their moment first. You know, they have they have to heal and they have to see change and they have to own their power and all of that. And then I feel like then men will be more allowed to do that. It's like, I almost feel like right now, are men even allowed to do that? Well, I think it's interesting because you mentioned power specifically and I was recently listening to a book that was talking about how you know women getting more power and getting more equality has we've had to look like what the traditional power mm. looks like which is you know a male and e even for the men that don't fit into that category is very limiting but you know it's pantsuits and it's you know um a deeper voice and you know not using exclamation points in your emails and oh. you, like all of these things that we've been told okay this is not powerful this is weak this is feminine and you know really challenging that and looking at what other ways power can look like and that doesn't have to be exclusive it can mm -hmm. be inclusive of all types of people. Yeah. And there's the whole, I mean, there's this men, women thing and what we're dealing with, but there's, there's also a bigger picture of that gender is probably, it j is just created by humans. <laughs> so like, I love to imagine a world that gender is not even a thing that we're all just people. And what would happen then? I, there's no way to know, but it's fascinating to, to think about and to process that we really, we sort of, cre we created these, these gender roles and we created the divide of, there could have been a third gender probably really easily. Yeah. In some cultures there is or was, and, you know, as the world has gotten more global and homogenous, like that is less of a thing. But I think, you know, a lot of people looking at the younger generation now are, talking about well why you know why are there so many transgender kids or why are there so many kids that are you know there's all these terms now for gender fluid and and a gender and all of these things and they're like well that was never around when I was growing up and it really reminds me a lot of the the LGBT 
the larger, you know, people said, you know, people weren't gay whenever I was younger or whatever. And that I think people were always there and they were always looking for different ways to be, but they didn't feel free to do that. Yeah. And so. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, while you were talking, it made me think of when I was teaching elementary and when the kids were done with their lesson, you know, as, as we were waiting for the teacher to pick them up, I would have them line up boys and girls. And because it was, you couldn't do one line. It wasn't long, you know, like the classroom wasn't big enough to form one line. So we had to have two lines and they would sit on the floor. And I was, you know, just now I'm like, no, I should not have done that. But that was back in 2009. I think a lot has happened since 2009 of these sort of issues, like no better. I mean, once you know better then you do better. So I wouldn't do that now because then what if there is a kid who's just like, not sure, like, what do they they, they have to like every, and it's just like a tiny microaggression. It was just like waiting in line, but that's like another like small way that that, that, that could have impacted that child's identity and self-worth and just by forcing that on them all the time. Yeah. I think that's why representation is so important because whenever you know, we don't see ourselves reflected or we don't see, you know, a variety reflected. Whenever you're told there's two options, then you feel like you have to pick from those two options. And, you know, that really, that makes me think of another thing that we talked about with this is, you know, everybody in this painting, I mean, we don't know about death, but they're white. Everybody's white. And, you know, that's a whole other topic that, you know, has not, it feels so big to talk about, but I think that's why it's important to have these conversations in the classroom and with students, because, you know, if any student in your class that's not white is not represented in this painting, Mm -hmm. So where are they going to see themselves and what is that going to mean for how they interpret it? Yeah. Yeah. I even had that thought, you know, cause this is, this is the first sort of art conversation that we're airing on the podcast and we hope to have many more, but I did have the thought after we did it, I was like, we chose a dead white guy <laughs> for, for the artwork, <laughs> but it's also like, you can't control what you're going to have that emotional response to. So we both had a really strong emotional response to this because we can see ourselves in this. I think that is really important that as we're creating curriculum for our teachers, that we incorporate a lot more than this so that we're giving all of our students the opportunity to find themselves in art. And if we're only showing, you know, modern modern European art, you're going to reach a couple students who feel really see themselves in it, but there's going to be a lot of students who, who will have that, that disconnect. And I guarantee, I bet we could find an artwork about this same theme. We haven't tried looking. I just thought of it, but uh, this life and death theme, you know, done by a black artist with, with black people in it, you know, or like whatever, or any, any other, culture or race, probably this is such a big theme. And so that makes me think, you know, if we were to show this in a classroom, which we probably wouldn't because there's nudity in there. I doubt a lot of you guys are going to share this in your classroom, but if you were, it would be a good idea to show others about the same thing, other voices saying similar things so that you can find your, your place. But I, I think it's also important too, to realize like you can't with every single artwork, you can't, you're not going to represent everybody. And so I think there still is a place for this art too, but the variety is really important. Yeah, definitely. Because like you said, I mean, every classroom is going to be different. Um, every neighborhood's going to be different and you want to reflect your students, but you also want to reflect, you know, the world back to them so that, you know, it, like we were saying, representation matters because when you see not only yourself, but when you see other people, like it's very hard to other people whenever you know their stories and you know their art and you know, you know, what their lives were like. I mean, looking at it through the lens of that, I mean, it would be very easy, I think, to look at this painting uh, if you were in 
the right frame of mind and think that, okay, well, only the lives and deaths and pain of white people matter. Like, that's the only Mm. thing we're going to look at and talk about. So, yeah, I think we can tell a lot about who gets excluded. um, Mm. And we can tell a lot about, you know, the history of the world. But I think it's it's important to make sure that they see everybody from everywhere as much as we can. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, being a, what is it? Cis het person, you know, like I'm, or cis het white person. (laughs) So like I, the representation, I don't necessarily like, I see myself represented everywhere I go. However, when I like the, when I see like fat people in TV shows and in art and in um, things like that's where I see myself. And I, and I know, like, I feel when I see myself represented in that way, because I'm not, you know, a small person, it is important to me when I see that. So anytime I see different body sizes on ads, when I see it in TV shows, like, I feel different when I look at those because I see it's not just a sort of depiction of this ideal, beautiful person. And well, they are beautiful, (laughs) you know, but you know what I mean? So like on that level, I can really connect with that feeling of needing to see yourself represented. And so anytime I try to think of the importance of representation for our children, I just, I can connect with like, that really is important to me to see. So I don't Mm -hmm. feel like I at, explain that all terribly well but no I think it's true because it it really it can feel like your story isn't worth telling if yeah you don't see your story already being told Mm. and you know I've been listening to a podcast it's uh, Ramadan and every day they do like a short story for Ramadan and it's in the second season of it but the first year that they did it it was you know people not talking about their faith they were talking about who they were outside of their faith and I thought that that was really helpful for me as you know a white person who as an adult doesn't um, have really a religion and So to see their stories and hear their lives outside of, you know, what gets talked about on the news or what makes the headlines is, I think, really powerful because it, it, even just for me going about in my life, you know, I don't know a lot of Muslim people. I'm not close friends with anyone who's Muslim. So not it helps me to see and know them and their humanity and I know it must be so relieving to actually have those stories be heard and not just be this one thing and not you know get just stereotyped all the time and that I can't even begin to imagine what that feels like but I I agree even in the small ways in my own life whenever I see something reflected that I can relate to is so powerful so especially whenever it comes to something like race or religion something that's more obvious to the outside world Mm -hmm. I think it's all the more important that it's reflected um, yeah, and and not just and and as you're talking, you you hit on right at the end is it's important I think to think about the au- authenticity of the the perspectives and voices that were that were showing. So yeah, you could have representation, but it could be negative because you're showing the stereotype. So if we use the Muslim people as example, we're we're we would show artwork that it's all about the stereotype of who we think they are, not actually them telling us who we, who they are. And so I think that is really important too. And, but that's really hard if you're coming, if you're on the outside of that group, 
I mean, but using the fat people as an example too, is that like, you know, I hate to see like a fat person who's just all about dieting and self-hating themselves and are the, they're the funny one, you know, like, oh, cause they, cause they can't win in beauty. They're going to be the funny one. And so like, you're not really seeing yourself represented. You're seeing how everyone else views you on the screen rather than like an authentic portrayal of who you are. So you can always tell that difference. Like, oh, they actually talk to the person who's acting that role, how it feels in that situation and not like some, someone making that up for them. So that's, yeah. and, and it made me think of, we went to an exhibit a couple of weeks ago of Sharon Nishat at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. And we have her art in both the Curated Connections Library and we have it in the Perspectives Curriculum uh, from Art Class Curator. And actually Jennifer Easterling and I are going to be talking about her artwork in a few weeks on the podcast. But, you know, you and I went to that exhibit and the whole time I was there, you know, there it's these photographs of Muslim women and then it had Arabic writing over their faces. And I kept thinking how dramatically different this experience would have been if I knew what that said, like if I could just read read those words. And, you know, I'm here experiencing this and processing it through what I know. But someone who is of that culture, I think she's Iran, Iranian, is going to have a completely different experience at that exhibit. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said for you know, the fact that we didn't know the language and that, you know, some of the um, information that was with some of the artworks would kind of talk about what it was about. But with the exception of a few poems, none of it was translated. And it, I think it's interesting just because, you know, that's not it's not necessarily for us. And I think that Mm. that's okay. It's not, you know, we don't know the language. We haven't spent the the time and effort to learn the language. Um, So, you know, that experience, that depth of it is cut off from us. And I think that that is okay. I think that's even good in some circumstances because, you know, we, we aren't ever going to know what it feels like or to, you know, have that experience of moving through the world like that. So, you know, I think it's okay if we don't get everything all the time. And I think it's okay, you know, if we can't always, you know, answer all the questions that a student has or, you know, whatever the case may be. I think it's important to still show the art and still talk about it and still have the difficult conversations because, you know, not everything is for everyone and that's okay. Yeah, that was really good. Wow. Okay. So we had gender. We talked about race in this art. Um, Is there any other things that we left out later that we wanted to talk about? I know you wrote some stuff down. I think... You know, I I did think a little bit about, you know, the patterns that he used in the artwork. I mean, he's famous for his patterns already, but, you know, it really, it makes me think of, you know, quilting or maybe wax prints, stuff like that, that really, um, it made me think more about the whole culture around quilt making and it being you know, usually women, older women sitting around and like they're these generational things that get passed on. So I thought that was an interesting addition to thinking about, you know, because they're all kind of like cuddled up together. And like, I think of, you know, whenever you're on a bed with your siblings or your parents or whatever, and everybody's like, squished in because there's not enough room and I don't know it just to me that's like a very specific like kind of love that I think the patterns add to yeah and it feels it feels really weird to be talking about patterns after talking about such big things but yeah I can see that too and especially there's so many and it's almost like those patterns are more stories to tell about the life that that person led like each quilt is some part of their humanity, some part of their story. There's 
there's things wrapped in it. And so the patterns themselves could be like maybe a symbol for the complexity of life or the richness of life. Maybe. I mean, I think, you know, I haven't counted, but I almost wonder if like each pattern is there for one of the people that's, you know, in the group and, Mm. you, you know, maybe like it's a metaphor for the life that we're weaving as we go. You know, because I see, I don't know if you've seen like the people that will like crochet or knit like every week or every day is like a different color and it reflects either something that happened in their life or the weather or, you know, Mm. something like that. So I think that that is, you know, an extra part. I'm like, okay, who does this one belong to? And what is that dot in their life? I think it would be fun to do that with students too and kind of have them you know, make their own pattern. What does it look like for them? Yeah. Tell the story of who they are through a pattern. Yeah. Oh, that's got me thinking about what I would be, what my pattern would be. But then we've got death's pattern Mm -hmm. and he is all one pattern kind of, well, not real. Well, it's hard to say, but there's a lot of, (laughs) yeah, there's a lot of crosses on his, which is another thing we didn't necessarily bring up as a sort of a religious component here. Yeah, it definitely, I mean, the cross, of course, is, I think, mostly related with Christianity, especially now. But yeah, it almost does make me wonder, like, I think of like a a bishop or something, like, you know, they have Mm. the robes and the hats and all that. I'm like, you know, the kind of ferrying people into the afterlife or something like that or yeah so death is like a afterlife clergy person Mm -hmm. and that's his his robe and i want those circles in the middle to be peace signs really bad and they're not but i'm I'm reading them as peace signs and that's all i've seen the whole time but they're not but i feel like they have to mean something because they're they're different like one is has so if if you are um, listening, there's in the middle of death, there is two circles. They're gold with a black background and they're kind of random. There's not any others that are like this, but there's one it's circle has a, like a T in it, a line that goes across the diameter and then a radius line going down. And then the other one is just a, like a split down the middle, a line straight. And I've been staring at those a lot, wondering like, did that have any sort of meaning? I don't know if it, I don't have any meaning for it. But I've been looking at it. I mean, they definitely look like symbols. Like they almost remind me of, um, you know, like cattle brands. Mm-hmm. You know, they definitely feel like they symbolize something. Or maybe, maybe just because there's two of them right on top of the other, but they also make me think of like doorknobs or locks or something. Uh, I also have been seeing like the death, the, thinking the Deathly Hallows from Harry Potter when mm. I look at that too. For some reason, the triangle. Yeah. I also thought it was interesting, you know, we didn't, because it's not, you know, important necessarily for the interpretation or the art connection, but we realized uh, last week too that the painting had done well and won awards whenever it first came out. But even after it had won awards and been in a frame for a few years, Klimt went back and altered it, which I thought was really fascinating because, you know, we talked, you've talked on the podcast before about how perfection equals failure. And, you know, I kept thinking about the fact that he went back and changed it. And art historians believe that the painting, the background used to be gold, um, much more what we, I think, associate Klimt with. But the fact that he went back and changed it, I'm like, okay, what is what does that mean? What lesson can I learn from that? Because I'm always looking for one, especially with art. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, I think one thing, especially in an art class that students have to learn is that mistakes are going to happen. And whether you, you know, call them mistakes or you call them, you know, happy accidents a la Bob Ross um, or something like that. I mean, you're always, they're going to happen in life, just like they happen in your art. And trying to do better and like you were saying earlier when you know better you do better and 
you know, I think it really impacted the meaning too for the background to be dark instead of gold. And I don't think that I would look at it or feel as connected to it. I think I'd still love it, but yeah, I think we don't have to be a perfectionist to recognize that there are opportunities to improve. Yeah, I think it's a really cool story to tell students because you think about it, like I, I I'm trying to put myself in like Clem's position that he painted this. When you make a work of art, and you know this as a writer too, but it's like you, it's so it's such a vulnerable experience. And so when you make something and then you give it to someone else to consume, like it's really hard. And you're putting yourself out there to be judged. So I even view that as with my business too. Like when when I put something out there, it's taken me a lot of years to get used to like negative feedback, and because it is, it is me, but it is not me at the same time. And so I can imagine Klimt in the situation. You know, it's out there in the world. It's winning awards. It, five years have passed before he, he made it. Nineteen ten, and then nineteen fifteen is when he made those changes. But there was probably this sort of wiggling thing in the back of his head that was like, this is not right. There's something not right here. And then as he gets experienced painting, because a lot can happen in five years, as he he paints more pictures, he realizes what's missing and he changes it. And I think that's really cool. And then I also, when I look at it, something we haven't talked about is the space, is the background, is the space between, the negative space between death and life. There's this like black void there. And I can't imagine that being gold and it being effective mm-hmm. at all. I feel like it would completely change the meaning because if you don't, we, we none of us really truly know what death is, what's on the other side. And I think the black in this shows more of that unknown. Mm-hmm. And I think there is depth to that unknown. I don't know what that is, but like you can see it in the paint. There's like, you can see the other colors. It's really kind of a rich texture, but it shows that the unknown. And I think the gold would read as more religious, maybe. Yeah, no, I agree. Cause I'm sitting here trying to imagine it. And I think what comes to mind for me with a gold background is like, you know, some people talk about heaven being, you know, streets of gold and stuff like that. And it's funny because even with all the crosses on death, I don't necessarily read this as a religious painting, but with the gold added, like it feels somehow loftier. Like it's not like, I think, especially in society now we're kind of separated from death. Like, you know, we, it's very sanitized. It's the hospital, Mm -hmm. you know, bodies get taken away very quickly. The way that you know, corpses are treated as even very sanitized. Like it's very, it, it kind of takes the the flesh and blood out of it, I think, a little bit. And I think that the gold would do that here. Yeah. And that made me think of two things. One, like it made me think of early Christian mosaics from like um, the Byzantine mosaics. They had these guys who were really long and narrow and like they were draped in these robes. You couldn't see their bodies, but they were clearly really long and narrow. So like that death figure, he's reminded me of those guys all along. The other, other people, not so much, but like, I see that. And if you would add that gold there, that early Christian Byzantine, like feel to it will, would be extra heightened. And so I think for me, I would, I would have a hard time separating that influence, but then also yeah, having the black background like makes it feel more earthy and fleshy and and human, especially with the whole pile of humans and <laughs> blankets. Like we see a lot of skin, we see a lot of like lusciousness uh, with the the patterns that are like blankets. Like it feels more just human and and relatable. Yeah, like, it feels more vulnerable to me. Yeah, yeah. I don't feel I don't feel separate from it. Mm-hmm. And I think the gold might do that. Yeah. I think, you know, it all just goes to show that even if people are saying that something's great, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, finished. It wasn't finished. He had to go back. Yeah. I think it's finished now. It's so good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This painting is so good. 
And it made us, you know, talk about hard and uncomfortable things. I mean, like you said, at the end of the day, we're, we definitely have our own challenges and stuff, but we are, we're two cis het white women that, you know, that's not such a bad thing to be in this world, all things considered. And we don't, we don't, you know, it, it, it is hard. And I think, you know, I, I, I remember reading a study not that long ago that it was, I think it was almost 90% of teachers in general were white women. So, I mean, we definitely are representative of, you know, most of the educators in school and, you know, it, it's okay to be uncomfortable and it's okay to not have all the answers and to, you know, kind of stumble through things because, the more you stumble through, the more you'll find the ground beneath you and it won't be so rocky. Yeah. I think that's a really, this is a really good thing to end on. Hopefully we didn't have anything else that we can't, we probably will. There'll be something we're like, God, we should have talked about that. But, you know, I, I did an episode once before and I don't remember the name of it, but it was about, you know, how we have to have these hard conversations. You know, I think it was the episode values demand action. I think that might be it. But, you know, these conversations are hard and they you're going to risk saying something that someone is going to be offended by, that someone's going to just um, call you out on. And honestly, from the perspective of someone who's going to put this conversation on the internet, and now people are going to listen to it, I'm a little bit scared because I'm like, you know, I'm sure there was something I said that was ridiculous. But I think that overall, it's important to show that these conversations are, even if it means you might feel a little bit of pain because someone calls you out on something, they're worth it. Because like, I love what you said, you know, that you'll find your feet underneath you and then you'll be better moving forward and you learn. Yeah. As you go. You can't get better if you aren't being honest about where you're at. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we covered some stuff in that, in that <laughs> hour or not an hour, but is there anything that we missed that, you know, now that, now that we're at the end of it, is there anything from your list or that things that we could have talked about? I mean, I think we checked the boxes on, you know, what I had written after last time to kind of remind myself, but yeah, I mean, like you said, I feel like we could keep looking and keep thinking and that's the beauty of art conversations and connection and yeah Yeah. it's never really over you just have to say until next time yes and so with next time in mind I have an episode idea that I was going to do about big talk versus small talk and I think that's a perfect one for next week so that's what I'm going to make next week about because you know we did some really big talk in the in these two episodes and, you know, I think that's why you and I get along so well. We both really like big talk, but I think um, that's a really, I want to, I want to dive into that even more. So that will be our episode next Monday. And thank you again for joining me, Madeline. It was so good. Thank you for having me anytime. I love it. Yeah, that, that was awesome. So uh, I hope you guys listening were just as energized about this conversation as we were and about this work of art. Again, we would love to hear your art stories. So if you want us to share your art story on the podcast, or if you want to be a guest to, to have one of these conversations with me, um, you can do that by going to artclasscurator.com slash podcast. There's a form on the bottom of that page that says share your story. If you fill that out, that will tell us you're interested and then we will go from there. So um, would love to for you to have your voice be heard on the podcast. So thanks again for listening and I will see you again next week. What's keeping you from showing more artwork to your students? Do you get stuck trying to choose a work of art or do you fear your students will ask a question that you don't know the answer to? Have you tried to start a classroom art discussion but didn't know what to say or how to get your students talking? Are you worried you're gonna spend a ton of time researching and planning a lesson that none of your students are interested in? That's why we created Beyond the Surface, a free professional development email series all about how to teach works of art through memorable activities and thoughtful classroom discussions. With Beyond the Surface, you'll discover how to choose artworks your students will connect with 
and learn exactly what to say and do to spark engagement and create a lasting impact. Plus, you'll get everything you need to curate these powerful learning experiences without spending all of your time planning. Sign up to receive this free professional development email course at artclasscurator.com slash surface. Thank you so much for listening to the Art Class Curator podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and give us an honest rating on iTunes to help other teachers find us and hear these amazing art conversations and art teacher insights. Be sure to tune in next week for more art inspiration and curated conversations.